Last week we had looked in God's Word at the story in the Gospel of Matthew, how Jesus feeds the 5,000. The 5, and, of course, it's a miraculous story, right? It's an amazing story. These people come to Jesus. They're out in the wilderness. All of a sudden, they discover that they have no bread, and it's late in the day. And Jesus takes just a small offering and multiplies that many times to satisfy the needs of his people. Today's story is the one that follows immediately on that, and it's a little different setting in that story, there was a crowd. In this story, there is just the disciples. In that story, the people had come to Jesus. In this story, people are, the disciples are struggling because Jesus has sent them away. We hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking in the lake. When the disciples saw him walking in the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, oh, friends of Jesus, I don't think I have to tell you that we live in a world where things can sometimes feel overwhelming. As I was thinking about this message this week, I was also thinking a lot about Synod and things that were coming up there this summer, and uh, you know, the agenda for Synod is somewhere in the neighborhood of 650 pages long. There's a lot of material that's sort of overlapping and intertwined with each other, and the delegates have just under one week to get through it all. All these complicated issues with lots of implications for how we live as a church. Feels a little overwhelming. Now, I suppose I should consider myself fortunate that I'm working because even though I'm busy with work, I'm told by a lot of people that once you retire, that's when you really get busy. You know, people assume then that you have all sorts of free time. Some of you are nodding. You're like, yeah, I know that. People have assumed that you have all sorts of free time now that your days aren't spoken for from nine to five, and they come up with all sorts of tasks and activities for you to fill your time, and you figure out how to line them all up and fit them all in, and it's overwhelming. We can get swamped by all sorts of things in life. Financial pressures, work deadlines, managing relationships, juggling kids' schedules and transportation needs. So many things are outside our control. It's a broken world, and we get swamped. Just ask Jesus' disciples. It had been a full day for them. Actually, it had been a very full season for them. Jesus' ministry was taking off. At the same time, he was arousing some opposition, and there's lots of different emotions that played into that. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, were told a couple chapters earlier, were testing him at every turn. His hometown, the end of Matthew 13, and even his own family, we read elsewhere in Mark tw chapter 12, had grown suspicious of his motives. His predecessor, John the Baptist, had been executed by the authorities. And yet... Despite all of this, Jesus' ministry continues to flourish. In fact, that very day had been a day full of teaching. More than 5,000 men, plus women and children, had come to a remote place to hear Jesus teach. And when the crowd grew hungry, Jesus had taken five loaves of bread and two fish, and he had fed the whole crowd. 
We're told that afterwards the crowd was so excited about this that they wanted to make Jesus king. And again, we can imagine all of the emotions that the disciples are facing. It's an intense day, an exciting day. And Jesus knew that they needed to get away. They were swamped, physically and emotionally. And I think we understand. But they would soon be literally swamped. It's a broken world, and one of the things that often works against us or seems to work against us is the power of nature. And there's so little that we can do to control nature. The disciples were told in verse 24 are a considerable distance from land when a storm comes up. Now, storms on the Sea of Galilee are known for being especially fierce. In fact, the word translated buffeted here in, uh, in our text has the sense that the boat is being tormented, tortured almost, by what's happening around them. They've been doing this for a while. Presumably, they got into the boat about the time the sun set, and it's now the fourth watch of the night between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. They're out there in the storm, alone with Jesus. Now, the Sea of Galilee is roughly 13 miles long by 8 miles wide. So if you want to kind of put it down here, it goes from about here to a little over the Rhode Island line, and it's about a four-mile corridor either side of Route 146. And you can imagine in a body of water that size, you are not going to save yourself by swimming from Whitensville to Douglas. It's just not going to happen. It's a broken world, and their boat is swamped. And of course, we see the same kinds of things around us today with natural disasters, and sometimes disasters we bring on ourselves. Tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis can wipe out a town or even a country in a matter of seconds. Wars, disasters, unrest can cripple an economy and leave a whole group of people stuck for a long time. It's a broken world, and sometimes we get overwhelmed. So whether by nature or by the circumstances of life, we are no, feeling, no strangers to the feeling that we're, that we're swamped. And sometimes even when we're doing the will of God, it seems that Jesus is far away. Notice in this text that it's Jesus who makes his disciples get into the boat. This trip across the sea is not their idea, it's his. In fact, he has to make them get in. It seems like they don't really want to go, and Jesus says, no. No, there's something you need to do. He sends them on ahead while he goes off on his own to pray. See, just because we are in the will of God does not mean that we are spared from trouble in a broken world. Just because we are following Christ does not mean that he will never feel far away to us. And so I want us to reflect this morning on four ways that we see in this text that God sustains his people when it feels like our boat is swamped. The first thing is that there's a boat. Now, I realize that in a violent storm, a boat may not seem to be a gift of grace, but let's face it, it's a lot better to be in the boat in a violent storm than not in the boat in a violent storm, right? Jesus commands his disciples to go together in a boat. The whole terrifying night, they were straining at the oars together. They had each other to process the figure that their eyes spotted coming towards them on the lake. What is that? Do you see it too? They're not alone. They had a boat to hold them together in the waves. See, one of the great gifts that God gives to disciples of Christ when they are feeling swamped is the church. You'll notice that you're, there's some blanks in your outline this morning. If you want to fill them in as you go along, a boat, the church. And like the boat, we don't always feel like the church is a gift of God's grace. After all, a boat is kind of small, and you're kind of stuck with the people that are there. And there may be some people there that you, you know, you'd rather not be there with. You know, they, they don't pull their weight at the oars, or they've got different ideas about the direction you should go in this storm, or something like that. And sometimes the boat gets leaky, and it lets in water, and, and that's annoying. And the 12 disciples were no different. They had their different ideas about how to see things, how to do things. And so sometimes when we're feeling swamped, it's easier to think that we should just go our own way. 
We can make church an event that we go to rather than seeing church as the vehicle of God's saving activity, that we are here together because God has put us together. And that's not to say you can never spend a weekend away or go to you know, some church on the beach sometime or something like that, but we have to remember that church on the beach is not our church. It's not the ship in which God has placed you with fellow followers of Jesus so that you can be rescued from life's storms with them and sometimes maybe even by them. There's a reason the early church fathers used to say that there is no salvation outside the church. There's a reason that a ship was one of the early Christian symbols for the church. In fact, even as I'm talking about this this morning, I can see the stained glass window in the church, church that I grew up in. The ship of the church, buffeted by the waves with the cross of Jesus Christ prominently on, this, on a sail in that picture. See, we need to be in this journey towards Jesus together if we are to be strengthened in the storms that face us. When you're swamped, one of the first and most important steps you can do is to notice the boat. Listen for ways that your fellow believers in this church, perhaps even, have similar burdens, similar struggles to the things that you are wrestling with and asking about and wondering about and crying out to the Lord about right now. And notice the fact that you're in the boat with people and God stuck them there. And wonder to yourself, why might God have stuck that person here with me right now? and be ready to be surprised by the answer. Christ has commanded his followers to get into the boat and to travel in it together. And if you look around the boat, we'll notice lots of drowning souls sustained because they are in the boat in which Jesus placed them. There's a second way in which Christ sustains his followers in the story, though, too, and that's through a miracle. Now, this is a means of support that I think lots of us can hear and we go, yeah, that's the one I want. I like the idea of Jesus doing something supernatural to intervene for me. To solve my financial problems. Maybe to spare me from the lie that I told to my parents this week or that, yeah, the, the effects of some sinful choice that I made along the way. To fix things so that I don't have to work through my fears. I mean, when I feel swamped, I think one of the best things I imagine could happen is that Jesus would stride across the waves and fix all my problems. Doesn't that sound good? And at first glance, it might seem to us that that's what Jesus is going to do here in this text. There he comes. He's up on the mountainside. He sees his disciples in trouble, and he goes, he's going to rescue them and make everything turn out all right. But notice, that's not how we always perceive God's presence to us in the storm. Instead of the celebrating Jesus' arrival, the disciples are actually scared by it. And part of me wants to scratch my head and says, what did they not realize? The other part of me says, this is how we do it all the time. When we're swamped, we don't see God's gracious provision. We fear. I get invited to a Bible study, or I'm given some opportunity to, to serve or to be stretched and step out in faith. And instead of seeing it as a gift of God's presence, I get scared because it seems like one more thing to do. A fellow church member asks me, Mother, maybe I've got too much on my plate right now, and instead of hearing this as a gracious expression of Christian concern, I immediately assume that they're an angry judge condemning me. One of the interesting things we see in the Gospels is that Jesus very rarely comes to us first with a miracle that we think we want. He's either interceding for us with his Father in prayer, or he's moving toward us in the midst of the storm in a form that we might not recognize at first. And we don't see the presence of Jesus all the time in the miracles we see every day because of our fatigue and the continued struggles of our faith. And so in some ways, this blank here, this after the word miracle, is a blank for us to fill in, each of us ourselves. 
what is the miracle that God is doing for us right now, perhaps as we're feeling overwhelmed, what is that miracle that we might be inclined to miss? And no, we don't want to miss God's sustaining of us in miracles. I do find hope, too, in the fact that even his first disciples didn't see him in the storm. And I think in that, we're, we're right, reminded that there is room for each of us to grow. There's room for each of us to grow in our understanding of the miracles of everyday life that reveal God's sustaining presence in our storms, that show us that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the storm. So we have a boat and we have a miracle. Third, God sustains us in the storm by strengthening us for acts of faith. And this is a really where the story gets to be really crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's remarkable enough to see Jesus walking on the water, but I think by now the disciples are at least used to Jesus doing some pretty crazy things that it's, it might blow their mind, but, but it is Jesus, right? I think it's even crazier to watch what Peter does next and to think in our minds that Jesus has told his followers, he's telling his followers that in faith they will do the same things he's been doing. When it becomes clear that Jesus himself really is there in the storm, something moves Peter to a really remarkable request. Lord, if it's you, or maybe we could put it better, Lord, since it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And it still blows my mind. What made Peter think of that? How did that seem like a good idea right then? I mean, you're in the boat. The boat's certainly better than being out on the water. I think I'm going to try to get out and see how that works. But there's something about the presence of Jesus that moves us to want to be where he is, even if that seems like the craziest thing we could do in the moment. So I try to imagine what it would be like to be one of the other disciples in the boat, watching what Peter does next as he lifts one foot and then the other out of the boat. Maybe he held on to it for balance at first. And then shuffles across the waves to go be with Jesus. Just try to get that picture in your mind, an act of faith. See, sometimes when you're swamped, there is no better cure for the sense of being overwhelmed than to begin to take steps toward Jesus. And so this blank, too, is sort of a blank for each of us to fill in individually. What is that act of faith to which you may be called individually or to which we may be called as a church? Where we have to get out of the boat and figure out what it means to go to be near Jesus. Maybe it is our schedules. You know, one of the greatest ways that we see in our modern culture is the pressure to do ever more with our lives, including on Sundays. And it takes great faith to see God and his word, take him at his word, that our lives function best in a pattern of rest and work. It's one of the reasons that here in this church, even, we have terms for things so that we don't burn each other out, we can build in patterns of rest. For our young people, it takes courage to trust that following God's commands for sexual purity before marriage is what's best for us. In a world that tells us that that's a crazy idea. And trust me, following Jesus gets pretty complicated in a busy and broken world. Think about the Old Testament saints, people like Joseph, Jacob, Moses. They too felt overwhelmed by life at times, and sometimes they didn't always respond in the best, most faithful ways. But it's amazing to see how obedience to the command of Jesus can help us at times to even walk in the storm. And so we ask ourselves, what kinds of acts of faith might God be calling you to, to me to, us to, right now, even in the middle of your storm?
I think it's important to recognize here, too, that the gospel message is not just, well, keep a positive attitude, put your nose to the grindstone, and you can do anything. Every once in a while, I'll be riding in the car, and I'll flip through radio stations, and I'll come to a country station, and I'll hear the song. There's a song that, that has gotten in my head from time to time that has a, a chorus that goes something like, where I come from, it's working hard to get to heaven. Maybe some of you actually know it, too. And it sounds so good, doesn't it, in some ways? Work hard, get to heaven. We're kind of wired that way. Do more. That's how you get God's grace, right? Put your mind to it, and maybe you'll even walk on water. But that's not the Christian message. Can believers do miraculous things when they follow Jesus? Well, yes and no. As Jesus issues the command to come to him, we find that the water will indeed hold us up. But as we still struggle with the wind and the waves, our own recognition of life's realities, we can't help fear but that we'll sink again. In Jesus' assessment, you of little faith will always be true of us in this world. You know, I'll be honest with you, in a broken world when I feel swamped, I don't always have a lot of faith. I think if I just work harder, that'll fix it, right? I look at struggling marriages and I feel overwhelmed that anything can change. I hear about young people who get caught up in the sexual temptations of the day and I wonder how the ship, whether the ship is going to survive. I watch families struggle with financial pressures and think it will take a miracle to get them safely through life. And that's where we come to our last piece of the puzzle in this story. Because while the Bible is our story, it is not a story that is primarily about us. It's not about how we will fix our problems or how we can utilize our full potential in order to walk on water and get to God. No, the Bible is a story about God and about his grace to us in Jesus Christ. About his love which leads him to stride across the stormy water to be with his people. And so the final thing in this text that we see will sustain us in the storms of life is the divine hand. Immediately, immediately, when Peter begins to stumble, Jesus reaches out his hand and graciously pulls him up. It's actually the third immediately in this story. If you have your own Bibles, you can maybe even circle that. Immediately, Jesus sends his disciples into the boat and out into the storm. Immediately, he confronts their fears with the words, it is I. And immediately, he lifts Peter out of the waves. Notice that even as he lifts them out, the storm is still raging. And the other disciples, they're still there in the boat. I mean, in some ways, nothing has changed. But in other ways, everything is different because the sinking believer has felt the hand of the Savior. And it's in response to all of this that as Jesus gets into the boat, the disciples worship him and say, you are the Son of God. I think more than anything else, the story is not just about us making it through the day financially, relationally, emotionally. Now this story is part of the journey which restores our recognition that God is God. It's a story of grace and forgiveness. It's a story in which our sins are brought to the surface of our hearts so that they can be dealt with, called out to the Lord, save me. And then we see in grace that God does indeed receive us as his own and redeem our failures. This is a story in which we not only see the Lord walk on the water, but we see our first glimpses of a Savior who allowed himself to sink beneath the waves. Waves of sin and death that, to lift up those who had sunk far deeper than look, Peter. See, a great, as great of the pressure as we feel from the work on our plates and the needs of our church and our community and from the demands of family and our desire for free time that we can fill up with things that are fun and lighthearted. Our greatest need in life is for love and acceptance from God, from the creator of heaven and earth. Our greatest need is that we were created to belong to a faithful Savior. And we need to know how to get back there. 
And it's in Christ that even the most desperate sinner can be invited into the boat and carried safely through the storm to the other side. Yes, it is a broken world. And sometimes we feel swamped. I know that. You know that. I hear stories from you. But in the storm, God has given us a grace that sustains us. He has given us a boat, the church, which holds us above the waves. He gives us the means to recognize Christ's miraculous presence coming to us in the storm. He gives us the courage sometimes to step out in faith as we respond to Christ's command to come to him. And he reaches out with his divine hand through Jesus to rescue us from sin and death and bring us back again to a place of worship and praise where we together can look at Jesus and say, you are the Son of God. There is none other like you, Jesus. It's a broken world. Sometimes we feel swamped. But God has given us a Savior to come to us in the wind and the waves and who calms our greatest fears and storms.